Ještě jednou dobré odpoledne, je 17.30, takže máme zde dalšího hosta. Jedná se opět o hosta zahraničního, který k nám přijel z Říma, z Univerzity Johna Kabota v Římě. Je to významný německý filozof, transhumanista, následovník filozofie Nietzscheho a člověk, který sám o sobě říká, že osobnost, která se permanentně mění a že bychom si všichni měli uvědomit, že jsme vlastně už nyní kyborgové. Navazuje to na to, co jsem uváděl na úplném začátku a protože je to zahraniční host, tak si dovolím opět přepnout do angličtiny. I would like to invite profesor Stefan Lorenz Zortner. Stefan, please come to us. Please sit down. I think, Stefan, in your profile there is so many Latin and foreign words that it might be good if you introduce yourself, what is your passion uh, in philosophy. I, I know that you are also involved in philosophy of music, that you are following Nietzsche, that you are talking about cyborgs and transhumanism. So I would like you to introduce yourself and please tell the audience your, your message. Yes, I'm, um, I'm a philosopher of transhumanism in particular. Um, sort of the way I got there was really by a Nietzsche. And then I realized from Nietzsche's thinking onwards, I realized all the te technological challenge which have been brought about. And they were all connected with transhumanism. And I guess many, many might not have never heard what transhumanism is. I'm, I'm curious, will you lift your hands? Who's heard the term transhumanism? Oh, actually, quite a few have heard the term transhumanism. So uh, if, um, if I explain that to an audience of sort of entrepreneurs, I would rather say, well, Elon Musk self-identifies as a transhumanist. Um, that's usually, and most of his companies are actually related to transhumanist endeavors, to central goals within transhumanism. Um, if I usually explain what transhumanism is all about um, to a younger audience, sort of at, at universities, I, I usually refer to um, Black Mirror, And whoever hasn't seen sort of the Netflix series Black Mirror before, I strongly recommend it to everyone because basically um, Black Mirror is the best way to introduce transhumanism um, to a wider audience. It's a wonderful series. It just works as a great storyline. And all the topics which are being covered by transhumanism um, are being dealt with in, in, the, in, the series, um, in the series Black Mirror. And what I'm doing is basically... I, um, all the challenge we are being confronted with here in this series by the latest technological developments, by artificial intelligence, cyborg technologies, gene technologies, they really challenge our most fundamental understanding of who we are as human beings. And um, that's what I've realized. And I've realized sort of um, there are not many philosophers, the entire culture in which we have been brought up in the past, you know, 2,000, 2,500 years, Um, have been structured by a way of thinking which is now being challenged by transhumanism. And we are still living in, a, in an era, we are still, in, we are still living in cultural in framing, in a, in a cultural structure which is, which is dominated by a way of thinking which is sort of called dualistic in the sense the entire culture is structured in a way that we, you know, um, that there's an immaterial soul and that the material body. And, and that has consequences on the legal level. And this is how, for 2,000 years, people have conceptualized who we are, um, how we see ourselves, how we relate to the environment, how we relate to technology. Um, and basically, transhumanism is challenging all of that. Um, the most transhumanists see themselves as humans as completely being embedded in the world. We are not, we don't have that immaterial divine spark. We are fully part of this world. We are only gradually different to other animals. And that raises an enormous amount of challenges. It basically leaves no, no, no aspect of the life world untouched. So from economics over, over ethics to, to the arts, everything's being revolutionized by this new way of thinking. And just to give you an understanding, um, just as one little understanding to show how, how the 
You know, the traditional Judeo-Christian uh, worldview has, has created encrusted structures in which we still live and which are basically still being shared in most parts of the world on a legal level. If you look at the constitutions, in most constitutions, it's still the case, animals are seen as things. Animals should be treated legally as a thing. And that is, a, that is, founded, in, that is founded in the Judeo-Christian tradition, going back to Plato. This is like 2,000 years of thinking. Because according to this understanding, it was we only we humans are special because we have that divine spark. And now in the past 100, 200 years after Darwin, we've realized, well, maybe we are not that special. This is a human hubris. We should be much more modest about ourselves. We've come about as part of you know, evolutionary processes, you know, just like all the other animals too. We are not special animals. We are just, you know, we have some capacities which other animals have, but other animals have, have special capacities which we don't have. Like the vampire bats in South, South America, they can live by blood, eating blood only, um, which we can't do. So they're different animals, have different capacities. So why, why do we see ourselves as such, you know, special? And it's, we talk about, and basically in, in most constitutions, in most um, legal frameworks all over the world, it's still seen we humans possess dignity, we possess personhood, other animals should be treated like things. And that's, that's highly problematic. And more and more people have realized that, that we are not so different. And that's the basic starting point also from, from transhumanism, that we are part of this world. And we are part of this world, we came about as a consequence of, of evolutionary procedures, and, and we only came about you know, the last common ancestor between us and great apes uh, lived on Earth about six million years ago. We as Homo sapiens have come about probably 400,000 years ago. Homo sapiens maybe 45,000 years ago. So let's, let's look ahead in the future. Where will we be in another 400,000 years? We will not be here anymore. We will have evolved further. Chances are extremely high that this will happen because everything's undergoing a process of change. And in contrast to the past times, um, we more and more have the capacity to actually influence evolution, to enhance evolution. We can alter who we want to be. We can use gene technologies, you know, um, in order to modify us, maybe get a green skin, and then we fly to Mars, and then we have used photosynthesis in order to get our energy. And I've got a friend from the Netherlands who actually made that change on a, on a zebrafish. He genetically engineered a zebrafish, and, and as a consequence, the zebrafish had the possibility to get 15 to 20% of its nutrition by means of photosynthesis. And it was a side effect that the zebrafish turned slightly green. And so, well, if we want to fly to Mars, if we want to leave Earth, and we might have to leave eventually, the Earth will only be around for another five billion years, so um, maybe we, we will need it earlier, I hope not, but you know, we'll probably need it earlier actually. Um, then we might need an alternative way of generating energy. And that's, we need to talk about gene technologies, digital technologies, cyborg technologies, you know, us getting, getting connected with, with, uh, with, with deep brain stimulation. Um, Neuralink, what, what Elon Musk is realizing, that's what I said, there's so many different procedures with, which Elon Musk realized, and they're all realized to, to transhumanist understandings. And digitalization, I mean, if I, the, the, the global use of the internet has only been created, and the public use has only been created about 30 years ago. The smartphone has only been around for 15 years, and we can not imagine living without them. 15 years on a global scale is, is quasi nothing. And if you look back in time, I mean, what I said, sort of, we have only been around for, for 400,000 years. And, and I mean, the Earth has been around for 4.5 billion years, the entire universe maybe, you know, 14 billion years. And, and so, so 30 years since the internet was established is nothing. And the smartphone, like 15 years ago. And so that, we can imagine 
what an impact digitalization will have you know, within 15 years' time, within 30 years' time, because the speed of technological innovations are even progressing further. And so basically, these are all the understandings why we need to think about the impact of emerging technologies and whether we actually want to live in that traditional Judeo-Christian framework which says only humans matter. Animals should be treated like things. And there was one, there's, so far, there's one country um, in, w in which personhood has been granted to, to, to an orangutan, and that was in Argentina. A couple of years ago, they went to the court and said, well, orangutans actually, with respect to their capacities, they don't differ significantly from humans. They should also be treated with respect, just like a human deserves to be treated with respect. And in, in Argentina, the, the highest court said, yeah, that's a, that's a fair judgment. We need, to, we need to grant personal to the orangutan. And as a consequence, the orangutan had to be freed from the zoo. And these are the consequences. So we can hardly underestimate the enormous amount of consequences which that you revised understanding concerning how we see ourselves, whether we are actually do we have that divine spark or are we merely credibly different from other animals? And if we start to rethink all the implications, um, then, then it just brings an enormous paradigm shift on all different aspects of our life world. And then that's what, that's what I realized and that's basically, I thought, well, it's, it's not just one person's endeavor. You know, we, we, all, we all participate in that you revised form of life, and we are all being confronted with the challenges which have to do with, you know, genome editing, deep brain stimulation, and digitalization. And so, so we need to get together and, and establish that in, in universities, in schools. Think about the impact of these emerging technologies. Should we do everything which we can do? Where should be the limits? And, and there are many procedures which are already very well established which are not legally, legally appropriate, um, which are not legally granted. And they bring about a challenge concerning, concerning many cultural relics. I mean, one example I just want to give um, before entering you know, further in, in the conversation, but um, one example is in the, in the UK, for example, um, it is already legally granted that one can have a child with three biological parents. And that's already biologically possible. Only in the, so far, only in the case where you've got two, two, two mothers and one father. And, but in the UK, it's only possible in the case where one of the mother had the mitochondrial disease. So that's sort of not in the cell, in the nucleus, but sort of it's a power of the house of the cell. It's sort of floating around in the cell. If they have some defects there, and the child later on, which gets born later on, would die fairly soon after, after having been born, then this new procedure can be, can be used in the UK. But it's an established technology. So you basically take the cells from two mothers, you remove the nucleus, move one nucleus into the other cell, and then fertilize the cell. So you really got a cell with three biological parents. And, you know, so far it's only allowed for therapeutical purposes in the UK. But what would be the case, for example, if there's a lesbian couple which says, well, we've got a, you know, we also want to have a biologically related child. There's a technology which works and we want to, we want to use it. Then the governments in Europe say, well, you're not allowed to do so. That undermines our cultural establishment. You're like a... You know, this is undermines our traditional understanding, you know, and family understanding, and so on. Um, or let's say you've got you've got two women and a man who say, well, we love each other. We are we are polyamorous, you know. We have a polyamorous bond. We love each other. We want to have a family together, and there is a there is a there is a technology which enables us to do so. And then you can have a child. Then it is technologically already possible to have a child. And then, then they say, well, marriage for all only means two people so far. Why shouldn't we open that up to three people? You know, it's all just a matter of, you know, it's even a traditional family. You've got two women, one man, and a biologically related child. It's, it's nearly a you know, very traditional conservative family. You've got all the constituents. And so that's, these are the cultural relics which are being challenged and undermined 
by using these new technologies, they open up possibilities and make you question, you know, what, why, why should a marriage be granted that special status in the Constitution? Why should it only be limited to two people? And that's, I'm extremely fascinated by that, and thereby I've realized we all, even in the most liberal countries in, 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 in the Western world, we all live in so many strong, relicted, paternalistic, maybe even totalitarian in some cases, structures, which, which um, prevent us from living a proper plurality, a proper difference, a multiplicity of different lives of what it means to live a good life. And we need to evolve. We, we need to allow the plurality of different lives to, 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 to flourish. And, 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 and so I'm trying to think through and promote and trying to show people the various implications of what transhumanism is all about and, and that it can ha help all of us to live better lives, basically. And it, it's a, it's a, it's, and when I deal and my students give, write, write their thesis on, big, on episodes of Black Mirror, they write it on, for example, the episode Nosedive from Black Mirror. Nosedive is a very good episode. It's about sort of if someone... If anyone has, if someone hasn't seen it, strongly recommend it. It's sort of basically the Chinese social credit system being taken in advance. So if you met someone, oh well, this person didn't smile, look at me, wasn't very attentive. And then I turn around, I, I identify the person, and I dis, I, 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 I reduced, you know, minus 10 points. And then that will have consequences for the credit store. Next time you will book a, a plane ticket, that might have consequences. And that is shown in, in part of the in part of the in the episode of Black Mirror. But it's already in place in 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 China for about 10 years, and it has consequences for the citizens. And so and so this shows just a small range of the challenges with which we are confronted with. And I, I find that highly fascinating. And no matter which stance you have whether you think that's highly dangerous, because there are many people still, and in particular those who have a more conservative outlook, still think that's an extremely dangerous idea, because it basically removes and undermines all the static structures which we've been living for, you know, 2,000 years at least. Um, no matter which stance you take, you need to be confronted with the issues, because the technologies are being, are being developed, and, and you need to realize which te technologies there are and which stands you would want to take. But in order to do so, you first need to be aware of the possibilities which we already have. And the possibilities we already have are just enormous. And every day there are basically new technologies coming about. Now, just recently the case with the Google, um, with uh, LAM Lambda, you know, the, with the Google algorithm, which basically seemed to have sentience and seem to be sentient and conscious, that's one of the Google engineers claimed, and that raises issue concerning how to treat algorithm. But yeah, this is, I don't want to just ramble on, but this is sort of the range of topics which are being covered by the issue of transhumanism. No? <laughs> okay, thank you for the introduction on transhumanism. <clears throat> I told you that it will be a very interesting guest, so I think we can now recognize. Well, um, the, the subject is whether it's a threat or a solution for the future. If we start to think more about transhumanism as a solution for the future, what's, what was your opinion? Exactly, the solution, at least as a very good suggestion, as a helpful um, procedure. I mean, when, when I hear people doubt or when people claim transhumanism is such a dangerous idea, then um, I just... Or when, when they think, oh, it's just, that's just something for the Swiss or maybe the people from Silicon Valley. It's just something for the rich. Um, and then you look at the statistics and, and then you, is that really the case? And then you just look, there's a very good website. So whenever you look, uh, when you look up for some statistical empirical in information concerning how the world has changed in various respects, there is a website from uh, the University of Oxford. It's called Our World in Data. And they've, on the best possible empirical data, you find results from, from global poverty, from uh, unemployment, to, to what are the dominant political systems over the centuries. And you find a very good statistical result. So, um, when you look back 200 years, what was the global poverty rate, the absolute poverty rate? And I'm asking that to my students, and then I wonder, no, how, how has it been developing the past 200 years? 
And many people think it's going downhill. Now the rich are getting richer and, and the poor are getting poorer and there's such a big gap and we are really worse up. It used to be much better in the good old days. Um, and, and then you look at the actual statistics and you find 200 years ago, all over the world, we've had an absolute poverty rate of more than 90%. And I'm not talking of, of a relative poverty rate, relative to the living conditions in the various places. I'm talking about an absolute poverty, like people just struggling to survive, just you know, having shelter and a place to live. And basically, more than nine out of 10 people were just struggling to survive all over the world 200 years ago. Even in a developed country like, like the UK, that applied to more than eight out of 10 people. That's, that's an enormous range of people. 200 years ago in, in England, we've had six, six years old who work in coal mines and seven years old who work in closing factories. And no one had 30 days of vacation. You know, this is, and nowadays, how has it changed in our times? because many of the technological developments took place during the past um, 200 years. Now we've got, on a global scale, we've got an absolute poverty rate of about 10%. That's, you know, that's still too high. I mean, there 10% of the people are still in the world just struggling to survive, don't have enough food to eat, they don't have appropriate shelter. But in comparison to 200 years ago, that's, that's a significant improvement. And that's, so just to show that, um, um, you know, it's, it's just in the interest of the rich, the technology, that, that's a clear way to disprove that. It's in the interest of the majority of people because for the majority of people, it's just important, you know, it's better to have food and shelter and, um, and to live longer um, than, the, than what the situation was about 200 years ago. And then you look at the same statistics, what about the development concerning the average life expectancy? And we've had an average life expectancy, I mean, 2,000 years ago, it was 30 years. Um, 200 years ago, it was, it was about 40 years. Now, even in the, in the poorest countries in the world, even in some better off countries like Nigeria, they are, you know, 60 years. In the best, you know, in the, in the, in the most flourishing countries here, in, you know, in Europe, they are about 80 years. In, in, in the richest countries, there might be 90 years, but, that's a, but, it, but it shows, you know, there's been a significant improvement. The life expectancy in the world has doubled in, in about 200 years because, you know, because we've, we've got developed technologies like vaccinations, anesthetics, technologies also just like, you know, better, uh, cleaner water, hygiene, better education, that's also a technology. When we talk about technologies, we shouldn't only think about you know, digitalization and the internet. We also just think about you know, getting the water clean, getting people educated. And, and, and that is part of a revised understanding of, of technologies also. When I talk about we need a different way of thinking who we are as human beings, I, my last, my, sort of one of my books which came out this year is called We've Always Been Cyborgs. And you're saying, well, I don't have an implant, so why, why am I a cyborg? But here, the, the understanding of cyborg is actually a wider one. And, and cyborg stands for a cybernetic organism. Cybernetic comes from the ancient Greek. It means the steers person of a ship, someone who's responsible for directing a ship. So a cyber organism is a, is a, is a, is a steered organism, an organism which has been altered. And in the, in the history of Western thinking, we used to believe that, you know, language is what, what makes us special. And language is sort of the human capacity. And where did we get language from? Well, according to the Catholic Church, um, since 1869, it came from the divine spark. God placed it as a divine spark and attaches it to our body when fertilization happens. And that has consequences for abortion and all the other debates. Um, why? At that stage, we are quasi, you know, we are quasi divine entities. And that's how we gain language. And that's still a widely shared understanding. But in the understanding that we've always been cyborgs means we've always been steered. We've always been alters, uh, altered organisms. And when did we 
When, how did we acquire language? Well, when, when I was born, I, I didn't have language. You know, we don't have language when we're born. We might have certain prerequisites, but then, it's, then we get it as an upgrade from our parents. Our parents upgrade us with language, our parents, our cultural surroundings. It's the first alteration which we get. So language is just an, it's a parental upgrade. And then we go to school and then we get further upgrades. We learn history, mathematics, engineering, whatever. And now we deal with digital technologies, gene technologies. And once we realize sort of even language, which is extremely useful, that's what you know, makes us, helps us structure our lives, communicate. That's just, that's just the technology which has become a part of our body. Then, then we can see the relevance of these new technologies. All these new technologies, gene technologies and so on, CRISPR-Cas9, genome editing, they are just in tune with what we've always been doing. We use the technologies in order to increase the likelihood of, of living good lives. And, and, and so far, if, you know, doubling the life expectancy, reducing the global absolute, absolute poverty range, that's just significantly improving the quality of, li of life. We uh, live healthy and longer, and, and that's why I think you know, transhumanism is, is, is very much in the interest of global justice, and it, it's, it's very much in the interest of every one of us living to his or her own demands, being able, you know, morphological freedom. We should have the right to use technologies and to alter our bodies in the sense how we want to be seen. We should have the right to use reproductive technologies in the way we want to use them, whether it's, it's in a polyamorous relationship to have a child or whether we want to use it in a different way. And that just shows it improves the plurality and the diversity of our choices. And that's, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful achievement. And we really need to take care that this still prevails. And, and we live in such a, you know, in such a, a, a diverse and open society. I think there was a very important sentence because you said we should have the right exactly. to use the technologies. And I am also a big fan of technologies. That's why I'm here. And I was inviting several people who are involved in technologies. In fact, you talk a lot about the genetic uh, or biotechnologies. We are just after two years of pandemic, which is still in some way ongoing, in, at least in Asia now and also in other countries. Uh, and, and to have the right is something different than to have the obligation or the, uh, to have the order from the government to use the technologies. And we, we all remember. Uh, the, the adopted RNA proteins uh, called vaccination against COVID, which is also the biotechnology uh, which majority of the people used in, in developed world. We had the discussion, uh, the ethical discussion, whether the, the rich part of the world should give for free the vaccination uh, to, to, to Africa and to developed countries, underdeveloped countries. Uh, but but at the same moment, even having the right, and some people could say, no, we don't want to use this vaccination. I, I have feeling that this new technologies and the COVID is just a good example, are dividing the community. Maybe it's a cultural aspect, but what I feel that in some cases, and it was very much visible, not only in COVID, but for example, in the tech, high tech technologies like uh, 5G networks, there is a community of people strictly opposing uh, the use of these technologies and, and, and they are becoming both groups of the divided community quite aggressive even because they can even attack each other if they talk about this technology. So what, what we, we should realize that there is a danger and we should work with it. Well, I'm not that big expert in transhumanism as you are, but I was involved in artificial intelligence systems and. I always think in a way that when we started the computers, which is approximately 40 years ago or 50 years ago, uh, then we had software, we, we got viruses as the danger. But now we have corporations globally protecting our rights because we have antiviruses. Uh, maybe there should be also systems protecting our rights in this transhumanism world uh, when we become transhumans and when we change let's say, the way how we respect other people. I also respect if you want to be a family with two women and one man, well, 
being a Muslim, you can have up to four women, so they are maybe further in that respect. But, but what's your opinion about this danger? How we should really treat this in an ethical way? Uh, because there is a danger and all these technologies can be abused. There's always a danger. And, and there's always a danger of, of an enormous abuse. If, if something gets, gets in the wrong hands, it can be used against it. Uh, it, it can, the more efficient a technology gets, you can wipe out humanity. You know, altering, using, using gene technologies, create a virus, which, you know, this has become too realistic. You know. But, you know, it, it's, of course, the, there are risks associated um, with these new technologies. And, but that shouldn't prevent us from developing them because we need to take the risk. Because the advantages which go along, with, um, which go along with these technologies, have brought about so many, so many beneficial aspects. If something gets too risky, obviously we need to abandon that. No, one, it's 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 a matter of calculation concerning the risk of the further implications. And there, um, and it's not that every new in innovation is something which has to be embraced. If there's something which where where you see the calculations as such, you know that has less positive aspects, more, uh, more, more dangerous ones, then we need to abandon it and develop something which is more reliable. But if something becomes uh, uh, reliable, then, then also, and here the other issue which you mentioned comes up, what about, what about if the right turns towards a duty? Can it be sometimes a duty to develop a new technology, to, that you ought to use something? The question is, does it have to be problematic? if you're actually, if you're obliged to use a technology. And then I wonder, you look back in history, you look back in history just about, let's say, let's say 30 years, 40 years, 40 years, you go to university 40 years ago. How do you write your thesis? How do you, how you, how do you hand in your, your exam? Computers were not around, widely available. You had handwritten exams. Everyone was, was just, you may be on a typewriter, but normally handwritten or you know, type, typewritten exams. Do you know any of your professors, do you know any, any of your high school teachers who would accept a handwritten exam nowadays, or thesis nowadays? No one accepts it. Why? Because the advantages of, of a PC, of a, the internet connection with a PC, are, are too big. The, you know, it's, the PCs, the smartphones, the tablets, they've become cheap, reliable, and you know, in, in the developed world, everyone can afford them. We all need to use them. And so here, if the advantages are such, if the risks are there, there could be viruses, and we need to protect ourselves against computer viruses. But um, the, the advantages of these new tech, of PCs, of smartphones, you know, are so enormous that it has become a duty for you to basically use digital devices in schools and universities in order to hand in your exams. So it doesn't even have to be problematic if, if a right turns into an obligation. And here there are some, some sometimes, and there are also some problematic issues, obviously. I mean, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very open actually on, on that issue. I just want to raise the question. Let's say, let's say parents can not only educate their children, but let's say parents you know, and we can already do so, like, can genetically modify their children. And, and, and it becomes a traditional, it becomes an established practice that you can make a small ge genetic modification and it leads to, it's very reliable, it is as, you know, there are always, something always goes wrong, but it's extremely reliable. And it has a consequence that your child will have an ex expected an increased life expectancy or an increased health span, so staying alive healthily, of, of 30 years in the average. So you make the change and it's guaranteed that your child, or the chances are extremely high that your child will have an increased health span by 30 years. And there are hardly any side effects, hardly any risks connected to that. Should that be a moral obligation? Is that a moral? Would it have to be a moral obligation? Would you? Would you, re, would you not use that technology? 
if it guarantees that your child lives longer healthily? And these are the tricky questions. And that's what, that's what many industries are working on. That's what many big companies are working on. Um, I, 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 for example, in the transhumanist sector, a friend of mine, she's actually a transgender transhumanist, and she's the best earning female CEO of the United States. So she was married, well, she was married to her wife as in a, in a, in a heterosexual couple for 20 years. Then she changed her sex, um, uh, her gender, she's transgender. Now she became a, a woman, and now they live in a, in a, in a, in a homosexual relationship, still together with the same wife. Um, they've got a couple of kids as well. And, um, and she's the owner of a, and, and, um, well, she's the owner of a big company, which she actually started because one of her daughters ha had a life-threatening lung disease in order to save her, li her daughter's life. And recently, she's been playing around, well, she's been working on xenotransplantation. Xenotransplantation means you take the genes of animals or of humans and humans integrate them into an animal. You create hybrids, chimeras, human-animal chimeras. And that's what she did. I mean, we've been to, I'd been talking to her about that about 10 years ago already. And she recently has created pigs with human genes inside. And then suddenly, at the beginning of this year, I read the news all over the world, a genetically modified pig's heart um, was, was created. So a, a human, it, it was a genetically modified pig's heart was created with some human genes inside, and it was taken and integrated and transplanted into a human being. And it was a successful transplantation. The patient, who would have died within a week or two, he actually survived for more than two months. And then he was, he did not die as a consequence of, of, of sort of the, um, of the transplantation. It was an additional bacteria which was transferred, which actually caused the death. So it was an extremely successful endeavor. So we, we studied, she realized as a consequence of a transhumanist thinking, um, she realized sort of a hybrid here, a human heart which grew up in a pig and it was transplanted and it, it helped the, 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 the child, uh, it helped the, uh, the, the person to survive at least for two months. And that's sort of breaking away from the traditional ways of thinking. And actually, um, sort of challenging challenge the boundaries of, of humans and animals, that's, that's, a, that's something many are working on. And right now, I mean, for example, one, we, we always take, we take it for granted, you know, we get older, but we've got, a, you know, we might have increased our life expectancy, but we didn't increase our overall life expectancy. So the oldest person, humans only get about 122 in the, in the maximum. That's sort of the really, human genes are not made to live longer. Does that mean that we, it is impossible for man, mammals to live longer? Does it mean this is really a limitation? We might maybe get, you know, 80 in the average. We are 80 in the average. We might get 100 in the average, 110, but like 120 is really the maximum. And 120 years is, is not that long, actually. Um, now, I'm, I'm normally sort of, the younger you are, you think, oh, I'm just 20, you know, it's, and then you're 40, and then you still feel like 20, and when you're 60, you still feel the same way, and my grandmother was 95, and, and she was still happy just eating her cookie the next day. You know, she was just, this is, when she was looking forward to another day, and when you're 20, you would say, I don't, you know, I don't, when I'm 100, I don't, I don't want to die anyway. But then when you're actually there, you, you might really think differently about the issue. Um, and, and, but there are, the, there are mammals, they're, they're like the Greenland whales who live more than 200 years. There are some mussels who live more than 500 years. And so here, the transhumanist idea is, is sort of, well, maybe, I mean, we've already successfully created some other human, human pig chimeras. Um, maybe we can use the, the genes from, which are responsible for an increased lifespan from the sharks or from the Greenland whales, transplant them into humans, and then we might increase our average life expectancy. You know, we might also get 200 years, 300 years. The working or undoing aging. 
That's, that's, another, that's sort of the story. We need to rethink how we think about aging. Um, I'm, you know, my student's about 20 years old, and I'm telling you, you know, you're at the peak of your flourishing. Realize that. Use your time now. From 20 onwards, everything will go downhill. Wrinkles appear. Hair is turning gray. Your energy is getting less. Your stamina as a man. From the age of 20, as a woman, sexual arousal declines. From the age of 30 onwards, everything's going downhill. Use your time when you're young. And we need to rethink that. We need to think, well, that these things which are normally identified with aging, with what we traditionally see, wrinkles, gray hair, that's just a typical sign of aging. Maybe that's the disease. And, and there have been biologists who've analyzed that, who've realized, actually, these dysfunctionalities which come about, which make your hair, hair turn gray, these are the same procedures which, which cause cancer, Alzheimer, Parkinson in the long-term future. So the same dysfunctionalities which, which lead to gray hair and wrinkles um, have really bad implications in the longer-term future. And so by, by undoing these, these stuff which we normally associate with aging, we might significantly increase our health, health, uh, health span. And, and many, many anti-aging researchers Many companies in the truck, uh, truck, truck companies are working on that. And, you know, then you can, you know, you can prevent the wrinkles and you can stay younger. But most importantly, you can prevent getting cancer in the first place and Parkinson. And that's really improving our, would improve our life expectancy enormously because the majority of people, um, I mean, we all have very idiosyncratic understandings of what it means to live a good life. If I ask around you and, and everyone, what are your preferences? There's maybe, there's probably not one thing which we all have in common. We all have very special idiosyncratic understanding of what it means a good life. However, maybe 90%, a great percentage of you would at least say, well, being healthy is in some way important. Maybe it's intrinsically important. Maybe it's instrumentally, maybe it's just a means because then you can travel and have, you know, have some drinks and so on. Um, but it's in some way important. And that's why undoing aging or increasing your health span is such a significant, is such a fundamental goal which, which many transhumanists try to promote. So we shouldn't, only, we shouldn't only deal with, you know, do cancer research and so on. We should continue, obviously. However, really starting to get to deal with the problems, the physiological dysfunctionalities when they occur, which have to do with the gray hair and wrinkles. Undoing, undoing aging when it occurs, so that sort of your your biological flourishing at the at the age of 20 will continue up to 30, 40, and so on. And that's that's really a rethinking of of many of our established paradigms. And more and more people, I mean, you know, this is something. It's not, you know, I'm I'm summarizing the people what from research. That's not me talking about, you know, what no serious biologist has done. David Sinclair, who's a, you know, who's a distinguished professor of biology in Harvard University, that's what he's suggesting. And, and there are others. You know, this is all based on, 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 on the leading thinkers, the leading scientists, the leading, leading entrepreneurs of our time actually associate with that transhumanist understanding. In Silicon Valley, there are many of them who actually associate and, and, and see themselves as transhumanists. Um, Ray Kurzweil, who's like making the making the uh, strategic decisions for Google is a transhumanist. Elon Musk, obviously the most famous one, and many, many others. So just to um, okay. show the relevance. Uh, I think it's, I, I fully agree that we should permanently look for, for the limits where yeah. we should still think about the ethical aspect because you say, well, we don't have Oregon Gutens in the Czech Republic, but like in Argentina, but we have special law protecting animals. Uh, it's not on the way you are thinking about or on the level, but, but still the living organisms on these planets are also viruses. It's scientifically proven that even viruses can communicate globally. That's why we have uh, modified versions and so on and so on. So where are the limits where we should really respect the animals as, as let's say, equal creatures on the planet? Where is the, and where is the limit according to you? 
I don't want to give an answer to that question. You know, it's not it's not me. It's not the traditional. It's a philosopher like in Plato. You climb out of the cave, you see the sun, and speak to the masses what the real answer. That's that's not how you know in ethics how it works. It it needs you you, you cannot just impose values on people. That's just the wrong way of doing it. We need a, we need a discourse, and the values which might be right for one country might not be appropriate ones for a different country. Um, and, and, and it is clear some questions which can be asked, for example, and have been asked in Iceland, could not be asked in Germany because of the Third Reich. There, there are other sensitivities and they need to be taken into consideration. So that's why I don't think there's, there's, any, there's any firm goal which we can aspire to or any, there's also no, no stable utopia which can be reached. Any utopia is highly dangerous. Whenever you say, oh, look at this is a technological, techno-progress, progressive society, and this is what we need to achieve, then I'm telling you, this will lead to a totalitarian society on an unprecedented scale. This is highly dangerous. There's not one answer. We need, any, we need to make the norms and, and values which are appropriate for the, for the specific region, for the specific country. The one thing which I'm really trying to highlight and trying to show the relevance of is, is the importance of, it's, in philosophical terms, it's the importance of negative freedom. Negative freedom means the absence of constraint. I, I just think it is, it is, historically speaking, that we, each one of us, has the right to live according to his or her understandings. What you dream of at night what you long for, if you don't directly harm another person, you should have the right to live according to that understanding. And I think that's, a, that's, that's an enormous achievement. And that's not been, not been present in most societies, and it's still not present in, in large parts of the world. In, 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 when you look back in history, it's always been the political leaders, it's been the religious leaders, and they told you what is my understanding has to be your understanding of the good life. And that's fascism, that's totalitarianism, that's paternalism, that's terrible, that's highly dangerous, that's making, you know, universalizing our, our tribes, affects, our wishes. But our tribes and affects, what we want to in lives, are extremely diverse. And, and the state should not tell you how to act if it concerns yourself or if you don't harm any other person by doing so. That that's always has to be prerequisite. And of course, what that exactly means, when do you, how can you, what actually constitutes a harming another person, that, that needs a dialogue. Um, but but it, I, I think it's extremely important. And, and, and you know, you know, having grown up in Germany, I'm particularly aware of, of the atrocities which go along with totalitarianism. And the one thing which we need to prevent is any totalitarian system to come about. We need to cherish the plurality and that freedom is an enormously important achievement. We need to fight for that freedom and that people have the right to individually make a decision about their own lifestyles because that's, that's, that's such a precious important because that's what in the end counts, that's what matters for all of us because, you know, what we all want to do is to live a good life according to our very, our very own understanding. And if, if on a, a government tells, tells you you're not allowed to do so, or you, you might have sanctions, you might not get a job, you have to feel bad about that if you've got certain desires, you need to oppress them, you must not utter your wishes in public, that's really dangerous. And that's, that's undermining, you know, you, you feel unfree when, when you live up in such a society. That's why I think um, freedom is a wonderful achievement, but it's an achievement. I'm not claiming, I'm not claiming even freedom is, a, is an absolute value, is something which is, you know, which is somehow floating in a platonic realm somewhere, which is eternally valid. I think it's a, it's a matter of, we are fighting. That's, we are fighting for norms and values. And, but I think that's a value which is worth fighting for. It's not, freedom is not, is not self-evident. Freedom is not something which, is, which has any higher status. But I think it's, freedom is something which we should cherish 
because it really increases the, the, the likelihood of the majority of us living good lives. And so that's why I don't give answers. I, I, but the one answer I'm, I'm saying, please don't underestimate the importance of, of, of freedom for a society and, and try to open up the possibilities. I think that's, that's the issue because we are here in the Czech Republic and we have experiences with totalitarian system as well. It just 30, 30 something years ago, we, we got the freedom and we enjoy it uh, so far, but we should re live in reality. There are many countries around, even in Europe, where there is autocratic systems and autocratic leaders. And if we talk about the development of technologies in many countries, there are already limitations done by politicians because they don't, they don't want to support this kind of development. I'm, 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 and, and, and this is one of the, I think one of the greatest challenges um, which goes along actually with technological developments. I mean, when some, sometimes in the public or in media, when you hear people talking about transhumanism, well, some claim, or some, you might think, well, the most important issue is whether, whether a super intelligence will develop, which will place us humans in the zoo, which, you know, or which will try to kill us humans. That's not one of the most, I mean, that's just, you know, I'm not excluding the possibility, but that's not gonna happen within the next decades. However, what is really a significant issue, which we all need to think about, is how, how do we want to deal with digital data? Digital data is being collected, and there's, there's enormous power, and we don't even realize when you choose, you know, on Messenger, sending photos, um, exchanging personal notes, having video chats, that's all, you know, it, 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 it's being collected now by, you know, by, by the messaging service, by Facebook, um, by Google, and if, if they want to look at what you you know what you're exchanging, you know they can. We need to check whether that has some security relevant issues that undermines the structures of our that goes against our standards. And they can enjoy they can look at the pictures you've been exchanging, you know. They're, they're, and once you realize that, you might think twice about what you exchange. Anyway, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, power. There's a lot of um, um, power which goes along with data. Many in economic systems say um, data is a new oil. Um, and, well, data is not oil. Oil is a natural resource, and data is an, is an intellectual property. However, the function is the same thing. Data, whoever has access to the data can use it, can use it against you. There's power, there are finances. Any research, social sciences, natural sciences, any policy making, marketing is only dominated on the on the basis of, of collecting digital data. So how should we deal with that issues? Well, we've got on the one hand in Europe, it's very difficult to collect the data. We've got the GDPR. We, we, we've just made legal regulations which makes data collection really difficult. However, we all freely agree to have, you know, Google and Facebook collect our data. And, and we're not worried, and you leave your smartphone next to the bed, anyone can turn it on and you know, live stream, whatever happens there, or get, collect the data. It's, it's, we don't, we don't even think about all the implications, sort of what can, we freely agree, we think, oh, it's a free goodies, which Google gives us. They are not free goodies, we are the products, we are working for them. They benefit, these big companies benefit enormously from them, because data is so relevant. But we've got another player in the field, and that player is even more efficient than you know, than, than the United States or than Europe, and that's China. Because here we've got a regulation in China with the Chinese social credit system, they can collect all the data. They've got the political right, only companies are supposed to work or function in China, which deliver or which, which, which grant the, the government access to the data they have. And once, and so they can collect from data from various fields and they can use it for research purposes and so on, and also to, to, to suppress, um, you know, the, the, you know keep the, to keep their political system intact. But that, the, the impact goes further. I mean, it also already has impact on, on the sciences. For example, the, the amount of peer-reviewed publications in academic journals, the number one in the world is no longer the United States, the number one in the world is already China. So China is making loads of money, gaining loads of power as a consequence of, of having the possibility of collecting the digital data. So, 
And we in Europe, we don't collect. We, 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 it's more because of the GDPR, it's more difficult to collect data in Europe. We are not using the data. But if, if data is so important for finances, for economic well-being, is that the right way of dealing it? Don't we have to rethink it? We need, we need, we need money for our financial well-being. We need money to pay for the, for the public health insurance. If the money goes to China, money can only be spent once. Then, you know, that has impact for our flourishing, for our future. We need, desperately need to think about the meaning of digital data. And it not only has a, has a relevance for how well our economic system, how well off we are financially in Europe, it also has consequences for the political regime. So, the money gets, you know, they get, they collect the data, they get richer, more powerful. And they not only use it in order to make their citizens richer, but they also use it as a government to expand their political system. They can use it to spend it on military. They've created the new Silk Road, the new Silk Road, which you know it, it goes via many different countries in Africa. They've got an enormous in, in influence in, in various African countries. And if they have the money, they, they spend it, invest it in these countries, their political influence gets better, bigger. And their political influence also means, also means the military expansive. That means they have got authoritarian regimes. So by not collecting the data, it's not that we are simply better off, we might actually be worse off, and China will be better off, and with that, and together with that, a political authoritarian system might expand further, which strongly undermines um, negative freedom or freedom as an achievement. So that's why I, I, I don't, don't, don't be afraid that, that like an, a, sent, a super intelligent algorithm will put you into a zoo. You know, not, that's not gonna happen in the next decades. You know, I'm not saying it can't come about, but you know, I, I, I think we urgently, we really urgently need to rethink how we want to deal with the data. And because it's important for our financial well-being and it's important for the political system which we live in. And if we don't want to end up in an authoritarian system, in a, in a Chinese dominated system, then I would, I would strongly recommend rethinking how we, who, who we grant access to the data and how we want to use it. Thank you. We are coming to the end of the session, so I would like to also give the space to the audience to maybe ask some questions to you. So if there is any question, there I can see the gentleman. Yes? Many, many things. That's, that's an extremely important question, obviously. Um, so the question is exactly what, what is the trade-off, no? Is it, is it, is it really, and that's, that's, that's sort of a general, uh, often used response, and by using the technologies in our human interest, aren't we destroying the environment? Isn't that leading to climate change and so on? The question is the following. We need, the, what are the consequences? Well, how can we regulate the usage of the technologies? Can we implement, if we implement something in, in the European Union, what are the consequences for the rest of the world? In China, several hundreds of new coal-powered power stations are being built. India, the same thing. The, the, the consequences for climate change are enormous. What they, if we just shut down some coal-powered station, they, they build a hundred new ones. It's, it's the, we cannot undo what we cannot undo what is being done in you know what is done, being done in, in bad consequences in other countries. So the question is, how can we solve that issue? Well, one one solution would be to establish a global government and tell everyone what to do. That's not a likely option, and that's not 
uh, that's not a really feasible option either. What is one of the major drivers of the climate change, of destroying the environment? Well, one of the major drivers is, well, are humans, because we as humans, consumption of red meat and so on, using gas and, and so on, is, is, is we are the major driver, drivers of the climate change. What would be the implications? If you think that climate change is a major issue, then you at least personally, would you have to stop from reproducing? Because by reproducing, you create other humans. Humans are the major reason for creating, creating, uh, causing the climate change. Um, should we then, if this is a, if this is a, if humans are the main problem, should we implement new eugenic systems, stopping humans to reproduce, implement a, a one-child policy as we've had it in China for some time? Should we implement that in all over the world? That's again, that's neither an issue, that's neither a consequence which is desirable, nor is it a realistic consequence. That's why I'm suggesting, no, we need to, we need to find a better solution. We need to find a solution which basically gets freely adapted all over the world. Why? Because it's better. And one of the examples would be, for example, um, the richer a country gets, the richer a population gets, the, the higher the consumption of red meat. Red meat is simply is identified with luxury. I'm better off, I want to have my steak. And that's what's happening in China. And China is getting richer, India is the same thing. And the meat consumption increases. And the, and the, and the, and the animal factories, the suffering, the slaughtering, the, is, is increasing together with that. And that's, that's, a major, that's a major challenge. Do you want to go to China and forbid them to, to eat meat? That's just not a realistic option. So what do, you know, that's not, not only not a realistic option, it's also a highly paternalistic and maybe even totalitarian action. So that's not a plausible implication of what we can do. So we need to find a better solution for dealing with these issues. And, and one of these solutions and, and one of these alternatives, for example, is um, in, instead, of, um, instead of having more, more, more um, animal factories and so on, well, we create in vitro meat. And, and we've already got in vitro meat, which is, which is being offered in, in burgers in Singapore, and they can already be sold. And they've got enormous, enormous advantages. So we don't need to kill, we, um, we, we don't need to have animal factories with all the carbon dioxide, exa uh, carbon dioxide emissions. We don't need to pollute the, the soil with the urine, and we don't, um, we don't have to give antibiotics to the animals because they all live in these terrible conditions and always some animal is ill. That's why everyone needs to be given antibiotics. They all need to be uh, given antibiotics all the time, which again has consequences on uh, creating antibiotic resistant cells. So by getting rid of that, by having in vitro meat as an alternative, we can still offer you know, uh, humans the possibility to eating meat, which is identified, you know, then with luxury, um, um, but without having the challenging aspects of carbon dioxide emissions, without having the problematic implications of, 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 of you know, increasing the light likelihood of creating antibiotic resistant cells. And this is just one example. So that's why I'm saying, you know, either we have the, either we have the option of creating a global government which implements eugenic rules, forbids humans to procreate, which I just don't want to live in such a society. It's neither realistic nor it's desirable, or we create technologies which work better and which have better implications and which have adapted by free choice by the people in the various parts of the world. And that's why I think this, you know, it's not the perfect solution, but it's as good as it gets because the other alternatives don't, don't seem to be feasible or desirable from my understanding. We talk philosophy, as you can see, every answer is quite long and complicated. Uh, we are coming out of the limit. Uh, I think Stefan is still here, so we can switch to informal discussion if anybody wants after this session to, to talk to, to Stefan. Uh, I would like to thank you for coming to Ostrava. I hope that it's not for the last time and we can discuss transhumanism in the future as well. So once more, thank you for coming. Many thanks to all of you.